creation of a vibrant Arab entrepreneurial renaissance. If successful, these academies could be expanded. And by the way, this advice I would give to any nation on the planet. Second, at a national level, establish a fund, establish and fund a working council tasked with the responsibility to rapidly transform human capacity building in concert with the country's head of economic development. Members would include private industry, education, government, and economic development experts. They devote their full-time efforts to the council and be held accountable for results. I'm not talking about people who are going to come together for a meeting once a month. This is their job. All national human capacity building councils would work closely with one another and create a pan-Arab joint effort. These councils would create human capacity building vision, strategies, and execution plans. And at the risk of being too bold, I would also recommend the appointment of a Minister of Human Capital and Economic Development in each nation. These efforts are intertwined at every level, putting them, putting them under one leader and elevating the effort to the national cabinet status level or minister level would accelerate the transformation and send a clear signal that both are at the highest levels in terms of national priority. And again, I would give this advice to America, I would give it to the United Kingdom, I would give it to any nation or peoples on earth. Third, also at a national level, create a world powerhouse in one or more of the growth industries of the future. I can see a number of Arab world specialized centers in excellence. The City of Life and Health Sciences, the City of Nanotechnology, the City of Creativity, the City of Alternative Energy, the City of Water Technology, and so forth. This would allow you to laser focus your human capital and capacity building efforts. I'm aware that you're already making progress in this area. Do more of it. In terms of economic investment, ask yourself what ripple effects would, the, would, would be created throughout the region and the world if you took even a minuscule portion of your tremendous wealth and focused it on building the premier global human capital centers for one or more of these growth industries of the future. Fourth, establish a group, perhaps through the Arab Thought Foundation, that constantly monitors best practices in human capacity building around the world and in the region. If another part of the world is experiencing success with a new idea or model, examine it closely, determine whether it can be imported to the Arab world, and take it. Great. All boats rise when any nation improves human capital capabilities. Fifth, convene the members of this audience more often, twice a year for major sessions and many more smaller but parallel special purpose sessions. This increase in collaboration points would create an enduring Arab Thought Foundation and thicker community focused on human capital development and capacity building efforts. June of 2012 might be a target date to regroup to take a deeper dive into the human capacity building efforts. This could be, slim, this could be a slimmed down version of Thicker 9. Six and last, implement a state-of-the-art online pan-Arab collaboration platform for the following groups. Entrepreneurs, educators, Thicker itself and the Arab Thought Foundation, and private industry. Constant and pervasive communication and sharing of ideas are going to multiply your effects. The last point I want to make is the time is not on your side. It'd be ideal if the Arab world had generations to solve its human capital challenges. Be wonderful. But you don't have that option. The youth bulge will not wait. I have not looked at the 50 year population forecast from the Arab world, but I'm betting that there will be a second and even larger youth bulge behind the one you're now experiencing. The Arab world has less than a single generation to make significant progress. I believe the window is 10 years. If I were an extreme optimist, I would say 15, but I'm not. 
Ten years is 120 months. It's the bat of an eye in historic terms. We live in a fast and small world that's getting ever faster and smaller, and every month that passes without moving in the right direction is a critical loss of time. Let us symbolically set the era of world transformation clock at 120 months and zero days today. Then push the start button and begin the countdown. Lastly, what I'd like to, to say is that I believe that, and, 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 I, and, I, and I believe your hearts are in this, and, and there's intensity and focus on this, the youth bulge is not a liability. The youth bulge is only a liability if we don't transform it into spectacular capability for the Arab world. I believe that it's a gift. And I believe that given the intensity with which you can bring to this and the fact that nobody else is an expert at this, you have a chance to not only, not only catch up, catch up to Korea, catch up to what China is doing, but right now the game is open and I believe that you can move forward and take a commanding position in terms of human capital and the economic benefits that derive from it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan, for rich recommendations. Shukran ala hadi tawsiyat wa hadi nasaih. I'd like to invite the speakers to take your seats, please. Sa'atlub min al-mutahadithin الصعود إلى المنصة من دون الإطالة يسعدني أن أقدم الزميل والصديق العزيز الأستاذ إياس العكاوي مدير ورئيس تحرير مجلة إكزاكوتيف وكذلك مؤسس شركة كي كونسبت وهي شركة أم لعدة شركات وكذلك مدرس مادة الإدارة والريادية في الجامعة الأمريكية في بيروت وهو أحد الرياديين في حوكمة الشركات في لبنان والعالم العربي. Uh, the floor is yours until 6:30. Thank you, Samo. Uh, uh, what a great event! It's the last session, yet in my opinion, it's the most interesting one. Before I introduce a very interesting panel and panelists, just in a few words to say that when I came back in Lebanon, to Lebanon in 1995, uh, to, to a country where I, I decided to contribute uh, with all the education I had uh, in Canada and Paris. And of course, back then there was a very strong promise of peace in the region that a lot of Lebanese came back in 1995. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, it didn't happen. Um, although I was totally bewildered and I didn't know at all uh, how, uh, wh how my uh, professional career would go, yet as a social, social entrepreneur it was very clear what I wanted to say. And for me back then it was so simple. It was so simple uh, as a labor economist or somebody who has studied labor economics that sol the solution was so obvious. Economics is about the economy. It's about the markets. And markets need money. And money needs consumption. Uh, and, con and to consume, we need ma wages and income. And to have these income and wages, we need the jobs. So for a labor economist, it was very simple. The job of any policy maker is to provide the right strategy to maximize utility of an existing resource. And here, of course, we're talking about the human resource. Uh, so that they we can guarantee that there's the biggest amount of salaries or wages being pumped in the economy and creating consumption. The long-term goal of any policymaker then should be developing this human capital in order for the human capital to become more efficient and more effective and worse more, so that it's worth more salaries, it could 
earn more salaries, more wages that will eventually pump into the economy and this is a virtuous cycle. And this is what we have been promoting for the last at least 17 years. Yet no change has happened, or at least no change has happened uh, uh, the way we want it. Of course we, we have converted or we have convinced, convinced a lot of people. Today more than ever we, heur, we hear about the importance of human development. The problem is that we didn't see the impact we expected. My grandma passed away last year, she was 96. And I remember the look or the smile on her face when she used to, in Lebanese of course, we, we are used to political bickering and around the dinner table, so we fight a lot and it's part of the, the, the ritual every evening. And she used to have the smile on her face and she wouldn't, she wouldn't be interested to be part of the conversation. So I used to go to her and tell her, Teta, why are you smiling? You know, she goes, because you don't know that the solution is one word. One word, when it's said, suddenly everything will be resolved. Until this word is said, uh, in our part of the world, I would like to introduce a very interesting panel um, to discuss and continue with us to promote the principles that we believe in. Uh, every, every solution has its own word. We, I don't know the word. But this word eventually <laughs> will be said. Um, we have with us um, Dr. Elizabeth Murray, Project Manager of the MIT Blossoms Initiative from the United States of America. We have Dr. Raj Bahala, Raj Distinguished Professor at the University of Kansas School of Law, the United States of America. We have Mr. Ramadan Salman, Executive Managing Director, Ethno Medical Center, Federal Republic of Germany. We have Ambassador Robert Pearson, President of the International Research and Exchanges Board, IREX, United States of America. And Dr. Richard Larson, Founder and Director of the Learning International Network Consortium, uh, LINK, United States of America. I would like to start with Dr. Elizabeth Murray. Thank you. Well, hello. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank um, the Arab Thought Foundation for inviting the MIT team here. It's indeed an honor for us to be here. And I'd especially like to thank my friends uh, Huda and Sheikha. A special thanks. Um, even though I'm the Blossoms project manager, what I want to talk about today is something else, uh, learning MIT Link, which is Learning International Networks Consortium. And this is something that is very important at MIT and is something that is dear to me and something that I feel passionate about. So I'm happy to be talking about it. Um, Link, MIT Link is a consortium of educators from around the world, especially from developing countries who, who seek to uh, use technology education in their countries in order to provide a quality education to a larger percentage of the population. Um, LINK was founded in 2002 by Professor Richard Larson, who will be talking at the end of this uh, session. And, and the reason it was founded was because in the late 1990s and in the early part of this century, so many people from these countries would visit MIT and to use an expression from this conference, they were trying to make sense of all the new ICT that was going on. They would say, people are trying to sell us computers and software, but we, we really don't know how to use these well for education. And we would, we would like to know how to use them well for education in our countries. So uh, Professor Larson thought that the idea of creating something like LINK would be a very useful idea, and MIT certainly backed it. And the members of LINK, of Link uh, collaborate to share their best experiences and to learn from each other's mistakes in terms of providing quality education in their countries. 
And um, a tenet, a main tenet of Link, and we've heard this uh, at the conference so far many times, is that today we live in a knowledge age. And the most valuable natural resources of, of a country no longer lie buried in the ground. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> but they lie buried between the ears of its citizens. And um, this is a main tenet of all of the people who come to Link and our members. Now, you may wonder why I feel it's so important to talk about LINK here at this conference. And it's because when we started LINK back in 2002, a very large number of our members at the beginning were from this region. They were educators from Arab countries. And when you think about it, uh, so for that reason, MIT LINK feels a special relationship with this region of the world because these educators have been with us now for almost 10 years in this consortium. And when you think about it, you think back to 2002, these people were doing something really unusual. I mean, they were working lonely in a, a very, with people not accepting what they were doing, working with e-learning. So they were really courageous and they were pioneers. But most of them came from uh, as I said, from developing countries where they understood certain things. They, they were really visionaries in some way because they could see that their populations where they, I heard yesterday, I heard two, per, uh, two uh, percentages about the youth population. One was 60 in this region, 60%. Another one was 75% that I believe I've heard today. But they realized that it is impossible really to build brick and mortar educational institutes fast enough to really educate all these people who want to go to university. And they understood that you could do this if you were able to uh, create excellent and um, uh, uh, well uh, quality or, uh, programs. And you could do this with distance education. They also realized that for this huge youth bubble, they really didn't have enough professors, they, and they couldn't have enough quality professors to do this faculty. But by using uh, e-learning and technology-enabled education, they could extend the professors that they had, and those people could reach more 